Hello and welcome everyone back to the Royal Talents Creator Studio Live. My name is Jeff Olson. I'm the Art Education Director for Royal Talents North America and I will be your host. A big thank you to everyone out there who follows and likes us here on Facebook and for making the show such a success with your support and encouragement. Today's guest is truly an original, a master painter, sculptor, draftsman, and designer. His creative journey has covered a multifarious array of artistic endeavors. He was born in a small Midwestern town uh, of Jacksonville, Illinois. His visual sensibilities were observed and nurtured at an early age. Later, he was mentored by Howard Sidman, which led to his first solo show at the age of 14. While drawing constantly, he continued his formal education at Layton School of Art in Milwaukee and Washington University in St. Louis, where he became a protege of Werner Drews and a disciple of Bauhaus design. Along with winning hundreds of awards, including several best of show and gold medals from some of the world's most distinguished jury venues, he has also made his mark in the visual communication world with industry lauded campaigns for Ralston Purina, Anheuser-Busch, 7up, and many other Fortune 500 companies. He has been featured in an array of magazines, including Art Direction, American Artist Drawing, Communication Arts, and Graphics. He is also featured in books like Lessons in Classical Drawing by Juliet Aristide. His pieces have been displayed in numerous group and solo exhibitions and are represented in private and public collections worldwide. He persistently challenged the art world to see beyond the surface. He revives the essence of numerous past masters and gives it a place in today's modern era. The renowned painter, Richard Schmid, called him a modern day Leonardo. Royal Talents has designated to him as one of our master ambassadors, and we created an oil color that bears his name, Mantler Mustard. Everyone, please join me in welcoming Michael Mantler. Michael, how's it going? I'm doing just fine. Glad to be here. Fantastic. What a wonderful and expansive career. Congratulations on so many accomplishments. Well, I've been at it for a while. <laughs> I know we're going to get into some of that. I can't wait to hear some of the background story to your career and, and your life and kind of what brought us to where we're at today. Uh, I know folks are super interested in hearing about your journey. Uh, we're going to kick things off with a few questions I have for you. Uh, and then when we get through those, uh, you have been gracious enough to send me some images and we'll go through those together and talk about the paintings as we see them. And then even more special, you've got a presentation, or I should say a demo uh, that you're gonna do with us uh, on some of your color theory uh, uh, philosophy, philo philosophy, I should say, your, your color theory philosophy, uh, I think is probably the best way to describe it. And we'll take a look at your studio too. I'm excited to, to tour around there. Uh, so without further ado, I thought we'd just start at the beginning and, and ask you what stands out in your memory uh, of your earliest days as an aspiring artist. Well, uh, my mother, who uh, uh, was a psychiatric nurse, uh, and, um, recognized it very early on that I was a little off the narrow, straight and narrow path, you know, that I was not quite like other children. And so she, uh, she shepherded me and, you know, and, and encouraged my drawing and uh, uh, creative efforts very early on. Uh, it, it, there's an interesting story uh, that's true, very true story. When I was like three or three and a half, my mom had brought some tests home that were the, uh, uh, the simplified square pegs and round holes kind of test, but they were pretty sophisticated because they were tests that they gave the people at the uh, institution where she worked to see what kind of treatment they might need or what, what building they should be in uh, with, with other patients. And uh, I put those together uh, in an amazing amount of time at that age. And uh, my mom knew that it was something phenomenal. So uh, we had people from the, I was in a little town in Illinois. We had people from Washington University in St. Louis and the University of Illinois and uh, the Illinois Institute of Technology, uh, several other universities come down and they come to our hometown and time me uh, to see me do these uh, little uh, puzzles. So my visual acuity at an early age was uh, uh, kind of off the charts, I guess. But uh, uh, my problem, the problem that I've had with that, and I can explain this has been a problem my whole life. I should be a lot more famous than I am. The problem that I had was they would, they would say, well, that was incredible, little man. Can you do that again for me? And, we, and I would look at him and go like, why would I want to do that? And you have another one, I'll do that. But I'm not doing that again. I already did that. So I, 
I've been that way my whole life. As soon as I hit a pinnacle of success, it's like I'm bored. I want to go on to something else. So that's uh, that's part of the drama of my life. And that's why I've done so many things and had so many experiences. And I think, uh, uh, I'm, <laughs> I guess maybe I'm a late bloomer, but uh, it's where I am now is a collective, a lot of different things. Uh, um, We're going to see some of that, I, you know, in the work that you shared. Uh, and and uh, as a, it was a surprise to me to see some of your more contemporary work. Uh, we're all so familiar with your academic studies and, and uh, just the fantastic drawing and, and the things that you teach uh, and have taught to so many people. So I think folks are going to be really excited to see some of the studio work that they've probably never seen before. Mm -hmm. uh, and I love the story about moms. Moms are great, right? <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. what would we do uh if it wasn't for our moms right that's fantastic so you mentioned the Bauhaus in your statement uh and being a disciple what does it mean to be a disciple of the Bauhaus well uh, the uh Werner Drevis uh who was uh my instructor at Washington University I actually had five different instructors along the way that had come out of the Bauhaus uh when they got kicked out of Germany uh prior to the war uh, they they migrated to the Midwest where I was because there were a lot of Germans uh, in St. Louis and Milwaukee in the area and they, and, and of course they were talent you know Max Be Max Beckmann taught at Washington University was uh, another uh, German uh, painter that was a fantastic painter but uh, Werner kind of adopted me you know uh, uh, I I did things a little bit different than the rest of the class and just to give you an example. Uh, one of the assignments was to tear out little pieces of colored paper out of uh, magazines and make a color wheel. Well, I, I made this elaborate color wheel of all the colors of the Pantone book, you know, and uh, one of the little girls in the class said, well, he cheated. And uh, Werner went, no, Adam Mettler is very smart. <laughs> so, <laughs> That's a right, great right, right away, right away, I was in trouble and he said, uh, uh, Ed Mittler, you you sat at my drawing table, so I I was up in the front of the class behind the, his desk at his drawing table. So the rest of the class had to to look over and uh, uh, hate me. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great story. He's very smart. <laughs> okay. it, took, it took me a semester to to understand him actually. Yeah. yeah. My values were all wrong, you know, it's kind of that kind of stuff. So. A lot of people don't appreciate how what a significant impact Bauhaus uh, artists uh, had on education, art education in this country. Yeah, pretty much the educational system. Yeah, uh, uh, schools like uh, RISD, uh, you know, Cranbrook was a little bit different, but it was a similar kind of a, of, a, of an approach. Uh, but uh, Leighton School of Art, ironically, back then was uh, one of the top. Uh, five schools in the country and very, very progressive in terms of uh, Bauhaus design. Uh, and, uh, you know, they had a tremendous impact on, on furniture. And of course, uh, uh, they're, they're, they were going to save the world through design. You know, uh, I went to school with a lot of people that uh, ended up in the Peace Corps, you know, and so uh, uh, they were they were all out to uh, make the world a better place. And uh, so, you know, their contributions really were the biggest contributions were to everyday kind of kitchen utensils yeah. and chairs and, and and fantastic architecture. Not as much, uh, I mean, of course, Kandinsky, uh, you know, probably is one of the top 100 painters uh, ever, but, uh, uh, you know, a little less recognized for the fine arts than they, than they were for some of the utilitarian textile works and all that kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. I think of Kandinsky and Clay uh and albers i think probably yeah uh, well, albers, in color theory yeah albers very very significant uh, in terms of color theory you know uh, uh a other uh one of my other teachers who had rico lebrun uh for a uh, uh mentor at uh, yale uh hated albers you know and so did so did rico because they were they were just consummate old, old school draftsmen you know so so I got, uh, you know, I got a lot of training. You know, we had a very, very, Washington U had a, tr well, Leighton too, but they had a very strong foundation program before you, you know, went into the upper school. And uh, I was just very, very fortunate to hit it at that time before that kind of went away for a while with all the uh, abstract expressionist stuff, you know, so. 
That's great. So, well, you in early on, and I'm, I'm guessing at this because, you know, I didn't know uh, about the extent of your visual communication, your design work. So how did you become involved in that? Was that your first step or was that something that came after fine art? Well, uh, <clears throat> it, I worked all the way through college for uh, various, uh, you know, uh, art studios and, and what have you uh, and, and uh, uh, advertising firms. And uh, unfortunately, when I was uh, uh, right before I graduated, I actually dropped out of school for a semester because uh, I went through a very, very bad uh, domestic situation. I was married with two kids and my wife left me. I went into uh, commercial art. I uh, went and actually got a job at an advertising agency. And then I had my own little shop in the in St. Louis for a few years, which was called Hot Buddy Graphics. And uh, we won every award that wasn't tied down, uh, you know, in, in the Midwest, in Chicago, St. Louis, Chicago, Kansas City. Uh, I think one year I won like, uh, you know, 45 gold medals for those shows. So we, were, we were a pretty hot little shop. Uh, hot Buddy Graphics was kind of a uh, the kind of name you had back in that that time frame, you know, to keep on truck and stuff. So, <laughs> so, so I, you know, I spent a, you know, I spent a number of years with uh, uh, major agencies and opened my own shop in Dallas. Uh, uh, about eight, 1984 or something, uh, and uh, uh, we're just now closing that shop up because my wife kicked me out about 20 years ago. She told me there were too many bosses there, so I've been I've been painting for the last 20 22 plus years. It's been it's really been great because uh, I didn't have to rely on my art to make a living. So I got to experiment, and investigate a lot of different stuff, you know, which has uh, allowed me to come out the other end with uh, uh, hopefully a, a pretty unique set of skill sets. You know? It's really fascinating to hear that. And, uh, you know, I've been talking to artists for the last two years since we started this show, you know, so many different backgrounds and so many different stories. Um, but many uh, artists are wearing multiple hats, like you're saying, uh, and have been involved in commercial art, have been involved in architecture, you know, these other, uh, you know, applied arts, if you will. Uh, mm -hmm. And it makes sense that influence of the Bauhaus on you that that just it was, you know, there was no contradiction or conflict uh, to be able to be working on both both sides of, of the fence, so to speak, simultaneously. Yeah. Correct, because the Bauhaus was involved in a lot of topography, and and uh, you know one of our exercises we did was uh, to draw uh, Dewar Dewar's alphabet like you know twenty four inches high, you know, uh, so that was uh, you know just kind of brought uh, all the uh, draftsmanship and drawing and design together. Yeah. yeah, they're not mutually exclusive; they can feed each other, and I th I think you know some folks appreciate that, other folks I think would be surprised by how close that relationship can be. <laughs> Right. Yeah. You had a great uh, statement in your introduction on, on your website, and we'll make sure we post your website so people can go check it out. Um, but you talk about challenging us to see beyond the surface. What is it that you mean by that? Well, I don't really remember what I was thinking at the time, but I, but I can tell you what probably I, I was thinking about was that uh, I want people to be able to get involved in uh, the work. Uh, I want to leave uh, enough of uh, it looking like a uh, process rather than looking like something that is so finished that uh, you're going to, you, you might look at it and say, well, that looks terrific. And it gave me carpal tunnel to look at it too long, and, you know, that kind of stuff. Because uh, I think I, I just want to leave something for the viewer that they can feel like they're part of it, you know, uh, that they, they might anticipate the next, uh, uh, next couple of brush strokes or, uh, they might see an area that's unfinished and feel like the painting's unfinished, and that's fine with me because that kind of means they had a thought process that got them involved in, in what they're looking at. So, uh, yeah, I, I just want them to kind of understand that everything that I've done, regardless of the genre it's done in, is done with uh, a, a, a huge knowledge base uh, that I've spent a great time uh, uh, accumulating. And it's done with uh, a lot of integrity, you know. So that's that's what I wanted to be able to see, you know, that uh, it's not just uh, throwing some paint at uh, a canvas. Uh, however, you can be pretty famous uh, at that if you're that too. <laughs> if you have the right, if you have the right gallery uh, owner, you can. Do quite a bit. 
Well, I love that philosophy. I, that's something I embrace as well. I love seeing the process uh, revealed, uh, those multiple layers of building an image uh, and some of that exposed so you can kind of trace that. And mm -hmm. I think when folks see some of the images we're going to share today, they're going to now you know, really appreciate uh, how you've mastered that. Well, I just looked at uh, uh, Ennis recently, uh, you know, revisited him and blew up some of his paintings, which are not all that large. But uh, he actually did a lot of drawing in charcoal and you can kind of see a lot of that charcoal uh, coming back through. And it looks like he might've worked into a, a wet surface with the charcoal. You know, I, I don't know if it was a, uh, uh, oiled out kind of surface, or, you know, lightly oiled out kind of surface or what, but uh, uh, obviously the charcoal's held, you know, and yeah. it, it, does, it does look like it was fixed because the lines look like they're, you know, they're, they're part of the paint. And uh, yeah, so I, I, I love that uh, being able to see the drawing and the painting and the, and the drawing and the painting and have that all kind of layered into the thing. So a lot of, there's a lot of drawing, there's a lot of back and forth in my paintings where, you know, a lot of layers of drawing and painting and, and changing and redesigning. And, uh, you know, if you've ever seen some of these, uh, uh, some of the footage of, of Matisse painting, you know, uh, the, the painting goes through like a lot of gyrations. Uh, so it's, it's, it's kind of done when I ask myself, uh, is the next thing I'm going to do here going to make it better or just make another painting, make it a different painting? Yeah. And if the, if the answer is going to be a different painting, then it's time to start a different painting. You know, so. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I embrace that philosophy too. I, I, you know, you can spend all your time making one perfect painting, or you can make a dozen paintings where one of them is going to hit the mark. And, and I like that kind of uh, process. Yeah. Well, one of the things that I'm going to talk about today on, my, on the color theory thing is that about, uh, I don't know, maybe 10 years ago or so, uh, I became aware of, uh, of uh, Frank Morley Fletcher's uh, his color control and uh, through really uh, acquaintance with uh, Mar Myron Barnstone. And, uh, uh, I had forgotten a lot of, uh, of previous information that I had already had uh, in terms of color theory, and it kind of brought me back into a, uh, a method of, of getting a color harmony together from, from the get-go so that, that uh, I didn't have to worry about that, you know, so, so that's, that's what this whole color system is all about is, uh, is getting, getting, getting in you into a har harmonic, uh, chromatic kind of palette. Uh, that uh, uh, guarantees color harmonies. You know, so. well, I'm excited when we get into that. Uh, and I think folks are going to be fascinated uh, by the revelation of, of it all. A um, couple more quick questions before we look at the, some of the paintings. How did your relationship with Royal Talons begin? Well, I was at a, uh, a weekend with the Masters uh, in uh, uh, Monterey, uh, California. And uh, I met uh, a... Uh, young uh, gentleman named uh, Kyle uh, Richardson and uh, showed him my sketchbooks and uh, uh, Kyle uh, after a while ran me down and uh, found me uh, at uh, where he knew he'd find me sitting in the local tavern and uh, <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and asked me if I would like to uh, join uh, Royal Talents. I don't I don't think we were calling him calling ourselves ambassadors at the time maybe we were uh, but uh uh, you know, there weren't very many. I mean, you know, uh, Kyle had uh, just kind of started on that program. And uh, uh, at the, at when, when he started uh, uh, Rembrandt, uh, uh, the, the brand had not, uh, had not been receiving the, uh, the stewardship that it should have. And Kyle kind of brought all of that back and uh, uh, made it a, a very, very viable uh, uh, professional brand again. And uh, uh, I was glad to be kind of uh, part of that, really. And uh, uh, you know, I was doing when I was doing my little research on uh, uh, Robert Henri or Henry, uh, Henry, I guess it is. Uh, when I was doing my little research on him, I noticed in all of his color notes that a lot of the the paints that he used were Rembrandt paints. A whole lot of them, probably 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 sixty or seventy percent of the paints he used. He used a little bit of you know uh, blocks and a little bit of Windsor. Whatever else was, there were a couple of brands that probably aren't around anymore that I don't remember. Uh, but anyway, uh, uh, you know, I'm just uh, very, you know, very, very happy to be as associated with, uh, and I've been to the factory and know how they're made, which makes you even more uh, 
impressed with the brand. And uh, uh, one of the things I can say about uh, uh, Rembrandt uh, that has a lot to do with uh, uh, the, what I'm going to talk about later is that, uh, you know, it's, it's got the designation of extra fine, which actually in the industry means something. And it means that uh, probably the minimum milling of any pigment is probably triple milled. And there are probably some that are that are done six or seven times so that you get a nice uh, consistent uh, uh, dispersion uh, of, of pigment. And uh, uh, most brands can't make that claim. Uh, you know, there, there are a few others out there that, that, that can, but uh, uh, I, I'm always kind of uh, intrigued by people that try to convince their audience that the reason that their paints are like gritty is that uh, they're they're like the old masters use because the old masters would use the best paints today. They wouldn't use the gritty stuff they ground themselves. You know? and so that, that that's always been kind of humorous to me that uh, they they make those claims. But uh, you know, to each to each his own. But I, I like uh, yeah. I, I want to say let me say something else about 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 brands in general because one of the things that I've learned through through all of my research that I've done on this and all my experimentation is that people generally end up with too many pigments on their palette uh, from too many manufacturers because they'll take this workshop or that workshop and they'll like this particular mauve or this particular color and they just add that to their array of pigments. Uh, having been involved with uh, chemists from various uh, manufacturers, uh, you have to respect that each of these product lines are put together with uh, a different purpose, a little bit slightly different focus and my recommendation would always be to try to use as many pigments from the same manufacturer as you can. Now, there are going to be occasions when, yeah, I, I have to have that particular pigment on my palette. But if you're going to do that, try to get something that is in keeping with the extra fine quality of the paint you're working with. And don't just kind of just throw everything on there because it has a lot to do with mixability and how these paints relate to each other. And respect the fact that these chemists have been doing it a lot longer than any of us, including me. Uh, and and it's been handed down and handed down and handed down. Uh, and there's a lot of knowledge that's gone into the formulation of all these products. And uh, you, have to, you should have a little respect for that. <laughs> yeah, and I'm glad you brought that up. The, the experience of seeing the paint made firsthand uh, when you're in uh, the manufacturing facility in Appledorn is really a powerful one uh, and I don't know if it's just because I'm in love with color and art materials geek but but it was so uh, fascinating uh, to see it and impressive to see it and I love that you bring up the importance of milling uh, I mean I'm always talking about that when I'm talking about paints is you know pigment load is one thing but milling is super important as well for dispersion and luminosity and and uh, I'm glad you you made a note of that one more question uh, uh, before uh, we we jump in, although I, I feel like you've kind of already gotten into it, and uh, that is the features of Rembrandt oil. So you mentioned one of the the, the manufacturing features, um, but how about using it? What what is it that you like about it when you're actually working with the paint uh, on the palette on the painting? Well, this is true about the, the oils and uh, the uh, pastels. I think the organization of it uh, is. Uh, uh, just makes all the sense in the world in terms of, of, of the spacing of the pigments. You know, a lot of, a lot of uh, brands suffer from, uh, they get a new chemist uh, or they get some new demands for some new colors and they will be heavily weighted toward blues or they'll be heavily weighted toward greens and they don't have kind of an, uh, an even distribution of pigments throughout their line. And uh, talent has been very, very good uh, in, in, in terms of how their, their product line is organized. And, uh, you know, I've done this, uh, this system I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you with several other brands, and they're much more difficult because you really have to start, I really had to start to get into the chemist head and go like, well, why would they put these two or three pigments together instead of using a single pigment for this, you know? And it, it, it took me a lot longer to de 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 decipher <laughs> how to put, put this the system together with the other brands, uh, you know, so, uh, you know, 
just the organization of it, you know, and it's just, uh, you kind of know, uh, uh, you know, I originally, when I did what I'm going to do here is I originally put all the, the a lot of the permanent uh, colors uh, on this uh, wheel uh, because uh, they had already kind of solved the problem. Uh, now, the permanent colors, a lot of them you know, are dual mixes. So, uh, you know, I've gone back to some more intense, like magentas and that kind of thing. To, and, and there, but I still have some permanent uh, pigments in this array that, you, that uh, we'll talk about a little bit. Uh, <clears throat> anything else about uh, the paints that you want to know? I, uh, I like, they're, they're very buttery. Uh, um, the oil doesn't separate too much. I mean, you know, it's, it, but that, see, that's not a bad thing for me because basically I just uh, I put it on a paper towel and, and get rid of it because I, I, I feel that all brands of paint have too much oil in them. <coughs> I'm going to take a little sip of water here. Yeah, no, you, that's a great thing to bring up. A lot of folks are always curious or, or, or sometimes confused about what is happening when they see that oil come out of that tube. We call it oil shed. And it's not necessarily a bad thing. It depends on the, the quality of the product to begin with. But in an artist grade paint or an extra fine grind like that, it, it uh, yeah. you know, it's related to surface tension of the pigment and and how long the pigment is rested or set and often how the tube is stored. But uh, but yeah, I, it, there are several solutions. Uh, and I like yours, just putting it on an absorbent surface or using well, a paper well. towel. Yeah. Also, it depends on, on, you know, if it's linseed or if it's uh, sapphire, if it's walnut, uh, or if it's a mixture. I mean, people, a lot of people don't understand that sometimes you have to mix these because all every pigment has a different uh, need for stabilizers and dryers and all that kind of stuff. Right. Uh, and, uh, and and some pigments uh, you know, are constantly going to do that just because they're, they're, they, they do not absorb the oil the same way. You know, so it's, uh, you know, it's... it's if you understand the chemistry, you understand that it's not a big problem, you know. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Fetchin, for instance, uh, took all his tubes, uh, you know, he, he squeezed all his paint out on paper towels and let it set overnight, you know, because he, he wanted that brush stroke, you know, he wanted to get that brush stroke. Right, right. And that's that draws the oil out of the paint and leaves you with that stiffer, yeah. uh, uh, stiffer consistency, you yeah. know. Well, yeah. this came up recently and I, you know, and I made a comment on it on online. Uh, that somebody had asked Kyle if uh, uh, it was if that was a bad thing if uh, uh, that oil had gone out of it, and I, I mentioned well it wasn't a bad thing for Rembrandt because he used to work on the palette and he would leave his paint on the palette for like days, and and obviously it would get very very tacky uh, over the time, so I, it probably didn't hurt his paintings too much. I, I don't think. <laughs> no, no, not a bad thing, and, and and a lot of ways to go with it. Yeah, that that's a great example. Well, let, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen, Michael, and we'll start uh, looking at some images. Let me know when you can see it, okay? Sure, yeah. All right, perfect. So this is a great place to start, and I think folks who are familiar with your work probably recognize these right away. So what do we tell us a little bit about what we're looking at here? Well, you know, just looking at a, a few little uh, portrait studies, some of them were uh, class demos, and some of them were just done... Uh, uh, you know, to to kind of fill up my uh, as practice for for class demos or for for classes I was going to teach. I mean, there's you know the there's some that are that are done with uh, you know chalk and charcoal and uh, uh, pastel and uh, I've done a lot of work with sanguine uh, and uh, really kind of have, have done just tons of work with sanguine lately. Uh, but uh, uh, I've made a, a huge study of the human form, um, and I probably know more about George Bridgman than anybody in the world. Uh, he's, very, he's very misunderstood uh, uh, because people think that uh, they're supposed to draw like George Bridgman. Well, George wasn't trying to teach people how to draw. He was trying to give them diagrams that told them something about the, the human, you know, the construction of the human form. And none of George's students drew like him, by the way. You know, if you look at the work from his classes, they didn't draw like he drew. I mean, he probably, he probably would have, uh, uh, well, <laughs> I won't go there. He, he was he was kind of a vulgar little man, you know, but anyway, oh. <laughs> he, he, probably, he probably wouldn't have said good things to him, let's just say that, uh, if they tried to draw like him. 
so that's the first mistake. And, and the, the second mistake is that, that they think that he's actually trying to teach uh, anatomy, and he's really not. He's really trying to teach uh, more me the mechanics of the human form. So uh, I am at some point going to uh, take what I've learned from his material and, and do a updated uh, book on constructive anatomy, which is going to be, it's going to have a lot less images in it because it's uh, ironic that people go through these books and they draw every drawing in the books. You know, I've, I've done it a dozen times. Uh, and once I figured out what was going on there, they just put every drawing in there because in this culture, people think more is better. But a lot of the drawings are a very similar subject matter and some are much better than others. So you're much better off to take the good ones and draw them like a dozen times than you are to draw a dozen mediocre ones. So uh, that's that's the one point about Bridgman. Um, and of course, one has to uh, uh, be aware and uh, and read Robert Beverly Hale because he kind of uh, he kind of deciphers Bridgman for the rest of the world. I really enjoy looking at these and and you know and everybody is and rightfully so applauding um, you know the the uh, structure of of these drawings. But I'm really taken by the emotional power of the line quality, Michael. It is really really strong mark making in these and and just uh, really captivating well thank you thank you yeah and i think that carries over i'm going to go ahead and go to the next one so this is uh, a painting that a lot of folks probably are like wait a minute that's not the michael mantler i know <laughs> <laughs> yeah but i and, and here we can kind of see some of what we were talking about earlier where you're leaving things exposed this process of, of building the image but i'll let you go ahead and tell us about this piece well, these are these are you know what you would kind of call uh, deconstructed figures, but you know what what they are uh, are the, are the diagrammatic uh, uh, drawings that, that that I have done thousands and thousands of times, and I do to explain uh, figure structure and uh, proportions and and everything to my classes. And I uh, one day I thought, well, you know, I've done this so many times, maybe this is my art form, and. Uh, uh, if you look at look at what I've done here, I have uh, uh, I have created space by dim, diminution. In other words, the color of the big, the big figure in the front is brighter than the, the secondary figure is brighter than the third figure. So you have uh, diminution or smaller. And then you also have atmospheric perspective. The colors are brighter. Uh, so I, I'm bringing a lot of classical disciplines into these uh, uh, paintings, uh, and. The nice thing about this is I've, I've probably done, uh, I mean, for, for a number of years, I did three figure drawing, you know, I did a drawing of three figures together. I mean, they were clustered more together. You'll see some of those uh, a little later on here. Uh, but I did, I did a, a three figures every day. That was just part of my discipline, you know, and, uh, and so the subject matters wrote, I don't have to worry about the subject matter. Uh, I see, I see it as design other people see it as, as figurative work. So uh, for me, it gives me a, uh, a structure to do my design uh, investigations within. And uh, to the uh, viewer, uh, it gives them something to sink some teeth in because it's, it's uh, recognizable. I mean, you know, I, I'm looking at this little figure in the back here. I mean, that's almost like a, uh, an Athena kind of a twisted uh, little torso there. but. Uh, uh, anyway, these are all done from imagination. You know, I'm not, uh, I'm, I'm, uh, the way that I work anymore is uh, even when I have a model, uh, I, will, I will take the pose from the model uh, and get uh, everything uh, moving using the model and the pose. And then I will bring almost all the personal information uh, that I have. Uh, you know, I, I, I work from memory. And then after I get to a certain point where everything seems to be falling into place, I go back to the model to try to pick out some uh, some individual characteristics that uh, uh, you know make it unique to that that model. So, what's the approximate scale on this, Michael? Oh, this is that one's I think about five by uh, that's five by six feet. 
So pretty large. That's that's. Uh... Oh, yeah, that's pretty large. That that that's a smaller one of those actually. And this is in oil. Oil, yeah. Mm -hmm. And then of course you can see that I've come back and drawn on it, and then I'll paint that out and draw on it again. And that's just basically uh, uh, white pastel. Pastel is a wonderful mixed media tool. A lot of people don't appreciate that. It's it's really diverse. Well, you know, you have to. Uh, I, I use a spray fixative that's a uh, casein spray fixative that doesn't like obliterate the whites. To, I mean, it's it's you can still move that chalk around a little bit, but at least you don't have to worry about your gallery workers like wiping it all off. You know. Yeah, yeah. Well, and the casein is compatible with the oil, right? Because it's an emulsion. Yeah. 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 Yes. I worked with casein uh, a lot when I was in college because uh, I used to use it. I worked at the Muni Opera, and uh, which is their local uh, summer theater thing in the park, open air, and that's what we painted all the scenery with. I had a union job, paid great. I, mean, I was so lucky to get it. Uh, anyway, uh, here's another uh, three figure. This is uh, a little more colorful. I'm I'm, I'm working more now with uh, uh, more neutrals. Uh, in the backgrounds and stuff and uh, uh, trying to uh, uh, have stronger keys and, and let them, you know, part of the reason I've developed this new uh, palette that I'm going to show you in a bit. But uh, uh, yeah, all, uh, nearly all of these, I've, I think I only have one of these that I hadn't sold. You know, so I've sold all of these that I've done. Which I really enjoy up. these kind of guidelines or perspective lines, and what you will see even more of those as we get through some of these images. But it really uh, creates a wonderful dynamic. Well, there's there's a lot of uh, of uh, golden section and root rectangles and uh, all of that kind of stuff. That like, uh, uh, I mean, these are not reminiscent of uh, uh, Ian Uglo's you and Uglo's work, but uh, uh, yeah, there's a there's a whole lot of uh, measuring and and you know thinking about uh, baroque uh gamuts and sinister gamuts and lots of lots and lots and lots of design uh thought in the process yeah it's like a geometry of, of seeing here there's some more of them and these are all oil right with the pastel all oil yeah And they're very matte. I, you know, I try to keep them pretty matte. Oh, that's great. It's great. And then just these accents of colors, that bright yellow line against that violet background, really powerful. Yeah, well, that's that's this this is very much part of that uh, triad. Uh, you know, obviously my color key there is the yellow, and uh, uh, you know I've, I haven't overused it. So most most of my uh, uh, so that would be kind of a yellow, probably, uh, let's see, yellow, yellow, violet, uh, so, so the, the, the violets, the blues and the violets are, are, are the bottom part of my triad. So all of those neutrals are, are working out of the bottom, bottom of my, of my triangle. Love the neutrals, the grays in it really uh, make those other more saturated colors that much more powerful. Well, this see, you can't do this, by the way, with uh, uh, Munsell because you you don't get that saturation in your uh, in your neutrals. You know, that's it's just that's that's sad but true. I mean, I, I don't want to make everybody unhappy because it, it, a lot of people work with it, but uh, uh, I like to get those nice clean uh, neutral grays. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, wonderful. And here, I, would, I had this in mind when I was thinking of the, you know, the perspective lines and the structure yeah. the composition, you know. I do a lot of those lines. Now, th this is smaller, so I could do this with a straight edge, but on the on the big ones, uh, I do those with uh, Carpenter's uh, snap lines. Oh. So I, I'll put, I'll put a, a, a pen in the corner and... Uh, you know, thumbtack in the corner and thumbtack in the other corner and you just pull the thing and pop, you know. And a lot of times I, I put, I'll, I'll, these are all black, uh, black, uh, you know, chalk, but a lot of times I'll use uh, sanguine or uh, uh, a bright cobalt blue chalk, you know. I really enjoy these and as you 
you know, folks are going to see as we continue through these images, you know, those previous figures were very distinct and separate from each other, but here there's kind of, they're like organ organically bonding with each other. Uh, and it's a fascinating composition resulting. Yeah, of course, this is a triptych. These are not real big. Uh, uh, there's one here, what is that? Uh, four and a half by three or something. Uh, yeah, so they did about four feet four and a half by three feet each not <laughs> people out there are going not very big that's huge <laughs> <laughs> oh, and here it, it, this one's really nice and this is a pastel yeah that's uh that's uh uh Rembrandt pastel on uh and you know some charcoal line in there but uh on uh, btn kind of a felt gray it's abstracted, but you just still have the, you know, these are these are the body. Yeah, these are abstracted. Uh, this one was abstracted from figurative work. Yeah. yeah, yeah, you get well, you get that you see the structures and forms, especially looking at the previous images and how you construct things It. it uh, well, and, and this particular series, I, I, I took all of my uh, figures and turned them upside down. So they're sort of hanging. <laughs> The pastel is so wonderful on, on these toned grounds. Another pastel here, correct? Correct. Uh -huh. Beautiful. The color in this is just incredible. And this is uh, the color harmony that you get with these color triads, these musical, you know, musical chord triads. When your color, I mean, your color is incredible, but you're also, the values are, are really powerful the composition you know the large against small there's some some of the basic principles here are taken to the nth degree i really enjoy that well thank you yeah yeah i'm you know i kind of go through these looking for uh, uh gamuts that are going you know into the baroque and try not to you know try to have one dominate the other I, i'm i'm a big uh, advocate of uh imbalance that uh, some, some something's got to be in charge i i, I when I teach this material, uh, I explain it's like a good relationship uh, the, uh, between a husband and a wife. The wife always has to be in charge, uh, <laughs> at least 75 or 80 percent of the time, if not more. So uh, I think that you have to have that relationship between warm and cool, bright and dull, uh, thick yeah. and thin, uh, curved and straight. Uh, you know, you, you have to get the feeling that some, some, something is more dominant than something else, you know, so. Yeah. Uh, I even have a little checklist. I'm not, I'm not an A-type, so I can't go through these uh, and follow a checklist. But if, it, if I get to a point that something's not quite working, mm -hmm. I, go through, I go through my checklist and I'm going, oh, wait a minute, I have too much balance between cools and warm colors, or I have too much balance between uh, uh, curves arabesque and straight or whatever and i can you know if i go through my little checklist i can usually pinpoint it and go oh, okay so I, it's usually a process of elimination i'm looking at this one as you were talking and kind of going through that same checklist and what really stood out to me are these the placements of these cools uh in what is pretty much an overwhelmingly warm composition but it just makes them jump out and uh really sing. Thank you. That was that was my intent. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's great. There's another one. Same kind of thing going on here, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Really lovely. And I that I had to I'm so glad you sent this one. This is this is wonderful. Yeah, I did about a uh, I was doing those kind of for for my apprentices as demos. Uh, and you know, some of them were done with uh, multiple pairs. Uh, this one I didn't even use uh, 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 the model, but I, I have some white uh, plaster pairs here, uh, and uh, I do these color studies from those white plaster pairs. You know, I just uh, uh, imagine a uh, palette and uh, go in. And here, of course, I wanted to. I wanted my key to be that little little patch of yellow and. I, uh, the little uh, X's or plus signs, what do those denote? Well, you know, uh, 
uh, Uglo does this, and his teacher, uh, William uh, Coldstream, did it, and uh, many of the people that come out of the slave school uh, uh, that had them for teachers uh, do the same sort of thing. Uh, and those are just like uh, uh, denoting um, increments, you know. So uh, now that's not the case here, but when uh, Uglo does this, uh, these are all done like in Fabernucci sequences. You know, it would be it would be a one, two, three, and the little X's would mark the spot, and and that's how he turns the form, like the latitude and longitude of things. Uh, and uh, uh, I just think it's kind of a nice little surface thing that uh, uh, I don't want to do it too much because it is kind of mimicking what he does. But I mean, he he, he would spend uh, where I spent like uh, <laughs> 20 minutes on this. He would he would he would do a much better painting, but he would spend like 20 weeks on it. You know, so. It's really interesting to kind of look at them in relationship to the color. There, there are these kind of intersections of, of color and uh and the shapes i also like these lines that are coming down from some of these points and kind of break showing the breakup of the shapes in, in a linear way yeah and this kind of goes back to the to the buy house uh, there was a guy by the name of lionel finninger that uh, worked very much in planes at the buy house he was american they didn't quite know what to do with him there but uh, uh <laughs> And he was he was a little out of grain with it. What what else was going on there? So, but anyway, uh, he did he did some very very interesting paintings that were all broke up into. Uh, in his painting, pretty much synthetic planes, I think, but they might have had some rhyme or reason. Right. There's some great examples of his work at the Art Institute in Chicago. Um, he's a wonderful painter. Really enjoy his yeah. work. I, I went to I took some night uh, school classes there. I was. Uh, I, I went to I went to sign painting school in the uh, here's here's my little girl I went to sign painting school in the in Chicago and uh, uh, at, at, at night I, I went to uh, well I went to American Academy of Art and I also went to uh, uh, the School of the Art Institute uh, and uh, then later uh, I decided well you know I didn't want to be a sign painter <laughs> I want to go to art school so I went up to Layton and the uh, rest is history yeah. Great, great uh, city, great museum and institution for sure. Oh yeah, yeah. I lived, I lived there for a while, a couple of times. So this is great. We get to see the scale, and, and these are abstracted uh, even beyond what we were looking at earlier. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of uh, play, particularly like if you look at this blue one uh, down in the the, the, the right hand corner. Uh, uh, there's a lot of play between, if you saw this in person, a lot of play between uh, tran uh, translucent stains and, and letting the canvas uh, show through and then uh, more opaque passages. And are all these uh, based on the figure originally? Or are they, they coming out of forms of figure studies? Uh, or is it beyond that? Well, it, the, the the blue one up there in the center of the top that's that's just more straight design uh, okay yeah and then the red one is too uh, uh, it's beyond that I think you know they, they may they may have started off but I mean they, they've gotten so far removed from the figure you know. right right the one to the left reminds me of Matisse's red studio painting ah yeah well you know uh, interesting story about that uh, uh, I did a uh, nine and a half foot version of that, uh, and uh, it was commissioned. And uh, right. and they said, "Well, you know, there's, the, the proportions of the colors are different." And I said, "Well, they have to be because the scale's different," you know. And uh, they they were kind of perplexed because they thought it was just going to be that same thing only bigger, you know. Uh, and it didn't didn't they didn't understand that the relationship of the colors when you change the size. They had to change too, but that's that was. Uh, yeah. That's, yeah. When I when I said that's my design integrity, I would you know. <laughs> <laughs> These are great. Thank you. And this one's fascinating too. That's on a, uh, a swivel, uh, that uh, that easel swivels. In other words, I could I could spin that around. That's cool. Uh, I've got one actually behind where I'm going to do my demo. That it's a new one that I'm working on. 
That's great. I think I've seen one of these easels before in person. Maybeth makes makes that attachment you know, to their Lyra easel. Nice. And there's the man himself. With, with my lovely bride. Nice. nice. Who's, a, who's a wonderful, patient, mean, mean woman. <laughs> That's great. But, but, but she's put up with me now. Uh, we were married in 1975. I'm sure she's got to be a good wrangler. Yeah, she's my fourth wife, so she's a tough one. <laughs> All right. And this is kind of uh, a lead into the demo that uh, you're going to do. Do you want to do give a quick explanation of this before we, before we well, see the I, studio? I, I can do it a little bit. Um, you know, this is a, a this hexagon shape is a version of uh, of. Uh, you, can you see me on that end? No, no, I just see the image. Yeah, just see the image. Yeah. So, uh, uh, yeah. So uh, we have our uh, yellow cyan and uh, yellow magenta and cyan, which is our uh, Y uh, M C uh, uh, triangle, and we have then we have our green red. Uh, blue violet tri triangle, which is uh, our RGB uh, system. So I'm putting together both of those uh, systems. One, of course, is your uh, system that you have uh, in, in printing, your uh, CYMK in printing, uh, and the other is the system that you have in electronics for your computer, and, and et cetera. Uh, and I'm combining those two things together, which gives me six primaries. Uh, starting at the top, I have the yellow, then I have the uh, red, uh, red, orange, or vermilion in, in my case, and I have magenta, uh, which is going to be a quinacridone rose. Uh, then uh, between the magenta and the uh, blue, I'm, I'm inserting a quinacridone violet, mm. uh, medium violet. And then the, the blue down there is going to be a, uh, in dantherum blue. Uh, and uh, uh, then you have your cyan and your uh, green. Uh, so uh, this is by a guy I think I mentioned, uh, Harold Cuppers, uh, but I've combined uh, in my theory uh, several uh, different theories. You know, I, I, uh, some of it uh, has to do with uh, Frank Morley Fletcher, uh, but uh, uh, it goes back uh, uh, probably to 1908 when a, a gentleman by the name of uh, H. Arthur Hatt uh, wrote a book called The Colorist. And in that, The Colorist, in that book, uh, it states uh, this book was written to uh, dispel the theory that yellow, blue, and red are the primaries. And so they aren't, we can't, we can't mix uh, all the colors with those three colors. And but this you can. Uh, when I do my little demonstration, I'll hold up some other examples of this stuff. Perfect, perfect. I'm gonna go ahead and stop the presentation there. That was fantastic. Thank you for sharing all those images. Uh, it's yeah. wonderful to see the kind of different, uh, different approaches that you're taking uh, with the different materials as well. So now we're going to take a quick break and switch cameras so we can tour the studio and then we're going to get to the demo. Sound good? Sounds good. Mm -hmm. All right. I'm going to do a little tour of my studio. I'm going to start here with my wonderful uh, Rembrandt Royal Talents display. Uh, I'm sure glad that I have this because it's a lot easier to find, find the pigments when I need them. And uh, just follow me into the main studio here. And, uh, Plasters up here. Uh, you can see lots of my drawings on the wall. Coming up down. Some, some of these are little oil sketches. I know all these people quite well. Uh, they've been, been with me for a while. Uh, and, uh, sometimes my workshops, we draw from some of these as well as model. This is my blackboard area. But, uh, that I draw. This happens to be my uh, 
proportional system. I have a couple of, uh, a couple of friends that are, that are a little malnourished. Uh, and other materials, there's a lot of my Rembrandt pastels and then their uh, lounge area for the students. I have a, a little uh, area, a tabletop area over there with the tabletop easel that I that I work with. Uh, another big plaster cast in the corner. Another one of my paintings on the wall there. Okay. Well, I want to I want to show you this because you'll appreciate this. One of the products that uh, that I put into a lot of my kits, you sent them to me, are these uh, mini sets. Yes. Yes. And, the micro uh, sets. They're awesome. And they're just everybody loves them, uh, particularly when they see me demonstrate them. These are very, very quick little things, but uh, uh, I love the way the warm plays against this uh, kind of steel or felt gray, whatever it is. I don't know which one it is. But these are probably, what were these, 10 minutes? 10, 15 minutes sketches? Mm -hmm. 10 minutes sketches each. So, uh, yeah. Uh, I, I give them to, to my students in, in, in their kits, and, uh, and they stay in their kits until they see me use them, and they're like, whoa! I better try these, and then they're just all excited about them. So here I have a lot of flat drawer files uh, that are uh, full of thousands of drawings. Uh, here's uh, just a ton of paper. Uh, but uh, we go through lots of paper. Uh, anyway, there's, there's my stage. Uh, uh, I have a, a very good mannequin there. Uh, a very famous mannequin maker. A very famous mannequin maker. Uh, I forgot his name, but he's uh, one of the best there ever was, according to the people that I bought it from. Uh, and so I teach uh, to people to look for those bony landmarks and the alignments. And uh, I don't work with any contours at all. Uh, I work with the, the armature and the axis of the figure. And we, we try to end up with educated edges rather than contours, you know, so uh, that's uh, that's part of my methodology of teaching. This is my little front area. My doggies are acting up a little bit. We'll start with what I have in front of me here. Uh, I have uh, a uh, 154, which is a uh, permanent yellow light. Uh, I also have a lemon yellow. Uh, Depending on what you're working on, you could use either one of these uh, as uh, part of this array. So this is this is my yellow in my uh, CYM uh, array. Uh, this this becomes my cyan, which is a phthalo, phthalo blue green tone. Uh, it's very dark, so I'll have to mix that out a little bit. Uh, then on this other side, I have my but uh, Quinacridone Rose, which is representing my magenta. So that's my C Y uh, C Y M backwards uh, array. So the next I have uh, is the, the secondary colors, which I have a permanent green. Uh, I have both both a permanent green medium and a permanent green deep. Uh, you could they're interchangeable. You could use whatever one you wanted. I think this is a permanent green medium uh, over here. Then uh, I have uh, blue, the uh, endanthrum blue, which is uh, my replacement for the ultramarine. These are all organic, synthetic organic pigments. And it's very, this, the, the palette here, uh, that's unique to this palette, and they are. Uh, high intensity, high tinting strength, usually high uh, staining, uh, except for the quinacridones, uh, and uh, they are less intense. Now I've added, because these are less intense, I've added a permanent red, uh, uh, it's a R R254, permanent red medium, I think. Permanent, yeah, the permanent, yeah, it's permanent red medium. And then I've also added uh, a PV-19, which is a permanent violet medium. 
So the reason I've added those is these colors have far less tinting strength than on this side of the uh, out. <clears throat> then I have your wonderful transparent yellow oxide, transparent red oxide, and oxide black. And my white that I have everywhere is uh, your mixing white, your titanium zinc white. We take, we're only going to work with three pigments at a time. And we're going to use a musical chord, which uh, uh, was uh, first started by uh, Narada uh, back in the 19 uh, teens and early 20s. And let me show you some of this material. This all started with this gentleman that, that I talked about, uh, uh, J. A. H. Hat, uh, colorist, uh, is a book that he wrote. Uh, this has far more uh, colors, far more colors than we're going to deal with, but it deals with, uh, uh, he's calling it minus colors and plus colors, but it's basically your yellow uh, cyan, uh, the yellow magenta cyan and your green, uh, red, bl blue uh, uh, array. So you have six primary colors and that's what makes the system work. And then <clears throat> you have six secondary colors, which uh, we're going to add a couple on this side. Over here, we're just going to mix them. On the uh, phthalo side, we're just going to mix them. So that's one go back and talk a little bit about my Bauhaus experience because I had uh, a teacher that had Itten as a professor and the, and the color system, color wheel that you see that's Itten's color wheel uh, in all the books is not right. So I was taught the yellow, magenta, cyan, blue, green, uh, red arrangement in school. So the, the books, I think, probably started with a bad printing job and people took it from there because you cannot mix uh, all of the colors. You cannot mix, you cannot mix green with yellow and uh, blue. Uh, it just uh, uh, does not work. So uh, anyway, this is, this is how it was supposed to be done. Uh, you go back to where they probably took it from. This is a uh, Gerta. You will see that this is a yellow. This is a more of a cyan uh, than it is a, a bright blue. And then this is a magenta. So this is where all that material came from originally. So you can see that somewhere we went astray on the theory, which is, which is bizarre because millions of people have been taught the uh, red, yellow, blue uh, color wheel for centuries. And it's uh, just wrong. So we'll move on. Uh, yeah, I spent a great deal of time with this uh, thing from uh, our friend uh, from uh, uh, Germany, uh, Mr. Kupper, Harold Kupper. Uh, it's spelled uh, K-U-E-P-P-E-R or K-U-P-P-E-R, depending on whether you replace the, the take out the take out the E with the umlaut or not, but uh, you can see that uh, it can be divided up uh, in, a, in a zillion ways uh, if you want to go that far. Now, let me uh, say something about that because um, in reading all those materials and people like uh, Henri uh, and uh, uh, John Sloan, and they, they were all looking for uh, the perfect palette, which means splitting this up into 12 perfect increments divided perfectly by pigments. So they tuned all these pigments to get them to be equally divided, uh, which is a total waste of time based on what I'm doing because I'm only going to use three of these pigments anyway. So if I'm sort of close, I'm fine. Uh, so, Michael, there was like an explosion of color theory at the end of the 19th century, early 20th century. Yeah. Um, well, a lot of you know what started, contributed to that? 
Well, a lot of this started with a chemist by the name of Chavril uh, in France. Uh, he was a French chemist to, that was hired to uh, revive an old textile factory. And uh, he was not really a painter, but uh, his color theory uh, really stimulated a lot of folks. <coughs> and uh, uh, Delacroix and, uh, uh, you know, it goes on and on and on. Of course, Whistler was uh, into color a great deal to a little later. But uh, yeah, uh, the world changed. And uh, here's what I want to show you though, with the way that this works is if I have a color key, let's say yellow is my color key, all right? Then this is my five section. So it goes five segments down and it, it comes in between the uh, indanthrum blue and my cyan. So that would be a mixed blue between these two. Uh, then it goes over here to my magenta. So it has two of my CYM colors and this one falls in the middle. Now, everything that I'm going to mix is going to be within this triangle. Uh, yellow will be my key. Uh, I will be mixing a lot of, uh, of uh, grays and, and, and neutrals down through here. Uh, if I need additional color, just say I'm working on a portrait or something, and I need some reds, I can add this segment over here, and everything that I mix with that color will be in here. So I'm not mixing across the palette hardly at all. Uh, if I do, I'm, if I say I'm, I'm mixing, uh, this is Sam going straight across here to here, I would not have the same intensity. I would have a very intense red and a very neutralized green complement. And that goes back to Chabrol as, as well. So, uh, the other point here too is you don't have to starve yourself if you really want to put in some of these uh, convenience colors that fall on the line here. Uh, you can go ahead and do it. And it just makes all your color mixing much simpler. Here uh, to mark this off, we're going to go from here. 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 So that's one, two, three, four, here. I want to mix everything in, in, in this seg segment here. So you start by mixing your red orange with your phthalo blue. It's not going to take very much. And you get a middle tone in here. How do you de determine the ratios of one color to another? Well, experience more than anything else. But uh, I'm going to add a little lighter color here so you can kind of see where this is going. And you can kind of see that, that uh, even at that small amount of uh, the phthalo is uh, really taking that color over. So that, uh, that's being a lot higher tinting strength. And this is going to be kind of our warm neutral. Yeah. Uh, so you can see that that gets you that. Uh, and I'll just come down here and give myself a little bit more of this. But these are so much better uh, neutrals than you have with uh, the Munzel system. There's something hypnotic about watching colors mixing. 
Then if I go over here and uh, take my this color and put it there, and mix this color with that. Now that's this is a quinacridone, so it's not mixing nearly as strong as uh, my uh, that phthalo is super as, as a strength. Yeah, yeah, as a phthalo did. I probably I probably should have made that a little stronger. So now what you would do uh, is let's just do this and come down here. We'll just work with this one end of it, but you can kind of get the idea. Uh, so <clears throat> take a little bit more of this. And that's your vermilion again, right? That's my vermilion, yes, my vermilion. And all of my mixtures are going to be down in this end of the of, of my spectrum. I'll show you something else too. And I do have a uh, the black there, I have the uh, the vermilion, I think I ordered some vermilion from you, but I haven't gotten it yet. Uh, anyway, <clears throat> uh, so I can take these now and mix across. And as you see, these are very pretty mixtures in terms of grays. And if you want something then even between this and that, you can break down this mixture. And get a brighter color. So you would be using all the grays down at uh, this end. Uh, let's mix uh, over here. I guess I could have just twisted the thing around. We come from here. See, see this, this. This is this intermediate color. You mm -hmm. can kind of, see, kind of see how close I came to that, right? Yep. Uh, so I could I could use that color right there if I wanted to. So let's uh, let's do that. Let's come over here. Let's use this color, which is spot on convenience color for that. And. So that uh, you can see what we can do with this. Uh, if I have my orange now is my uh, my red orange is my key color. I take this red orange, and I'm not going to need much phthalo at all. You you can make 96 different blacks out of this. And I mix this. This becomes my black neutral because I have my oxide black I could use for this as well. And I just take just a teeny bit of this phthalo. It's pretty lethal. Actually, I should probably mix just a little bit of white with that. Take that. Put that in that mixture. I should have a pretty decent dark. Dark neutral gray. And I could I could work out to get it more black, but I just wanted to kind of show you what these uh, mixtures start to look like. Kind of very, very violet really actually. Okay, so I need to show you uh, if I want a green. And I 
want something that's more green over here, then I would come to this green out here, mix that, with a little bit of this color. And I get start, start to get neutrals that go toward the green. Now everything I'm gonna mix here is going to be in this triangle. So everything I'm mixing here is within this triangle. Everything I'm mixing here would be in this triangle. Let's just take this. Uh, a teeny bit, bit of that. So I got that, mixing that, this. So you would add this triangle if you were doing landscapes. Okay, you would add the red side if you were doing portraiture uh, or not. You know, it just kind of depends what the weather is like, it's overcast or whatever. This, this, to be real honest, this is more geared toward uh, what I do because I do not work all of Prima that much. I use a lot of glazes, so I have a lot of transparent colors out here. Uh, the one thing that I really want to show you is if I take this uh, uh, magenta here, it's, it's, it's not in this, and it, it ended up being pretty spot on right there. But if I take this magenta, That just a touch of to it. This is a mixing white. I don't buy the uh, hype of the uh, problem with zinc white. Uh, this, uh, this information. So that's lovely color. But if I take my, it's really beautiful color. If I take my uh, transparent red oxide. Transparent red oxide or is that the black? Ooh, that's that's the wrong color. I'm sorry. Yeah. I put the wrong color down there. That's the oxide black. But that's interesting too. It mixed really, yeah, it mixed really well. It didn't uh, wash out the intensity no, yeah. of the color at all. The oxide black is just a great mixing color. So here's my red. I believe that's the red, yeah. Transparent red. Yeah, let's see how this is. So, yeah, let's do this again. Now, oh, that's really nice color. Isn't that beautiful? And oxide red is such a wonderful. Yeah, but see, see what happens when you mix that with the magenta, what you get? And this is nice. a great, just a great color. Now, I could get a lot more into the ins and outs of this color theory. But uh, uh, you can just kind of see the potential of all this stuff. There's an incredible amount of variations, it seems like you could get from this. Oh, uh, you can mix, you know, because, because you're starting out with such high, high tinting power, uh, you can mix virtually everything from there. You know, now the, the, the advantage this has over uh, other uh, limited palette approaches is you're starting with a, the highest chroma you can get out of a tube. So, uh, yeah, a limited palette uh, with uh, your standard limited palette of, uh, of your yellow and uh, uh, cad, cad red and uh, uh, black. Uh, you can mix a lot of colors, but there's a hell of a lot of colors that you can't mix, but you can mix everything with this. I mean, and, and you, can, you can see that, that these beautiful neutrals that you get. And if you wanted to go uh, even darker with this, but, uh, this is, this, uh, uh, we're not showing in this, but I, I wanna show you this uh, in bathroom blue, which uh, is 
way to the green uh, side uh, if you're not lightening it. But if you lighten this color, and white to it, it starts to go a little bit toward what you would think on the purple side of an uh, ultramarine. But then, you know, you need it even a little bit more purple for it to work here. If you mix this uh, PV-19, this uh, uh, medium violet, uh, you end up with just beautiful stuff, you know. And these are, these are brilliant, brilliant colors. Well, that's enough. That's uh, enough to watch your whistle. Any questions right now? Well, I, you know, I think uh, a question I'm trying to anticipate what folks might ask would be like, is there a starting point uh, for someone? So you have these initial colors laid out. Where would the best starting point for someone be, for example, like a, a you know, taking a dive into this? Well, the best starting point, except I've changed all the pigments to, to much higher key pigments, much higher chroma pigments. The best starting point is uh, Frank Morley Fletcher's color control. All right. Uh, now, there's a lot of variations that I've added to that, but you understand the whole triad system, the musical chord system from that. And you can do, you can do uh, five, four, three chords, or you can do four, three, five chords. Uh, you can do them at various color intensities if you want. I mean, you can mix everything down from the top. If, uh, so I don't think there's, there's much uh, need. I mean, you could do a totally earth colors uh, variation of this, or you could do a totally uh, mineral uh, colors variation of this. Uh, I just I just happen to think that, uh, uh, that your quinacridones and your uh, and dantrums and uh, phalos are, are greatly underrated. I think phalos uh, kind of scare scare the crap out of people, so they avoid it. Avoid them. But uh, what you need to do before you really start on this now, you know, you could use like uh, a manganese uh, blue, or you could use uh, your uh, Severus blue uh, uh, to start with. But uh, you need this full intensity uh, occasionally uh, for mixing. So. Uh, that's why I like it. But ba basically, you probably should do that before you start mixing stuff down here. Well, I feel like, too, this this system, once you get those, you know, uh, get the structure of it down and you have your core colors, it still allows for a lot of improvisation, doesn't it? Uh, oh, yeah. Absolutely. No, I think that's I think that's the deal. You know, uh, I don't think this is a, a situation where you're looking for formulas. I think it's a situation where you're you're looking for aha, looking to investigate and looking to experiment. Right, right, like a point of departure. Uh, yeah, but maintaining harmony. Uh, yeah. So, so yeah. So if if I'm I'm mixing everything that I've got down here, uh, this, this becomes my whole palette with with, with this is my key, I guess, is, my, is, is going to be a blue key, because that's that's the point. So everything, all my mixtures are going to be down in this range, uh, and ending up with a blue note that's just going to sing next next to all the warm colors. Hope I didn't confuse everybody too much, but the Frank Morley Fletcher color control, there's a PDF of it, uh, and it's real easy to... Uh, that's in like 80 pages. Uh, it's really easy to grasp the system. Well, I'll make sure when I when I post this, when this is uh, out for everybody too, we'll include a list of the colors. And oh, I think yeah. that'll be helpful, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I'll, say, I'll send you this, this, uh, this list, uh, this final list. Now people are gonna ask, where can I get this fantastic color uh, diagram? Uh, and, the, uh, the color, um, for lack of a better word here, Mike, I'm going to say color wheel that you held up. Uh, that's one and only, isn't it? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, that's a composite. So, folks, you then make this video worth uh, even more. You'll have the, the visual <laughs> of the one and only Mentler color theory. And you don't have to go out and buy that, that awesome glass palette. 
you can work <laughs> you can work on your own, right? Oh yeah, you work on your own, and and you can do this on a smaller wooden pallet. Yeah, uh, yeah. You know, uh, or uh, one of these smaller, uh, you know, gray pallets that are that are uh, composite material. Yeah. Well, and the painting in the background kind of shows very similar colors to what you were just mixing. Absolutely. <laughs> that's why. That's why uh, my wonderful apprentice moved me around here. So, you know, and she's got to introduce herself too. She's hiding behind the camera. Who's your studio assistant there? At my studio assistant. It's Oksana. Hello. I, Hello. I, 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 <laughs> Thank you so much for being our camera person. Well, no problem. My pleasure. <laughs> Well, this has been fantastic, Michael. Thank you so much for sharing your insights on this. I'm sure it's going to be a revelation uh, for a lot of people. And it's just great to see also the alternatives that you're, you're uh, presenting to folks uh, to really enrich the, the color that they've probably been mixing before. Yeah, I think, I think the key is uh, I'm, I'm, making, I'm creating chromatic blacks. So I'm really not mixing a lot of blacks. And the uh, oxide uh, black that I'm using... Uh, this is really a wonderful uh, mixer, you know, to, and, and, and so it is in, in that through blue. Uh, you can mix a lot of uh, ochres and that stuff with those colors. And, and the, we didn't do anything with the, uh, uh, the yellow. Uh, I'll just uh, show you this. Uh, uh, if, uh, one thing I, wanted to sh I should mention here that I think is a big advantage uh, is if you have uh, a color like this and uh, you take, um, uh, let me spin this around. I love that that turns. <laughs> yeah, I, that, yeah, I should have done it this way. It wouldn't have been quite so hectic to watch. Um, so if, if I have that and I have this, I can create a radiant white radiant light by each of my darker colors and I can use these to lighten with instead of a straight white and it's a lot easier to control by doing that then adding the straight white to everything. Let's just do another one here. So if I come over here and pick up this color here. That violet, I could put some more white into that but I'm better off now using this mixture to go to cool colors that I might have and mix into that. Get a little more white in there. And for folks, again, this is the mixing white, uh, the Rembrandt mixing white. Yeah, it is. Uh, if you're only going to get one white, you know, uh, you could get, you could also use the uh, uh, titanium to mix with uh, colors that are so high in chroma like the, uh, the phalo. But so I have that. If I put that into my other mixtures, it's already got the cool in it. In it. Uh, hmm. it, it, it just gives me tertiary mixes that are just incredible. So you could call, you know, you could call these uh, lighteners. Uh, Well, that's a great shot. You can really start to see the relationship between the different mixtures. So I have a question. So do you do this prior to beginning your painting or no. are you doing this as you're painting? Uh, well, I would, uh, I would do a little bit uh, just to kind of get me some centers, you know, and then, uh, 
I would start to get some color on the canvas and uh, uh, I usually work out of a toned canvas. So yes and no. I mean, I, I start by, by mixing up, you know, getting, getting the colors out. I mean, I, I'm picking the three, the color triad that I'm going to work with. Uh, and you can work with one of these like forever. If you're just doing one type of subject matter, you may only use one or two of these uh, triads. Uh, but if you're doing still life and you're doing uh, uh, studio uh, uh, portrait work and you're doing uh, plein air, uh, you might have uh, four or five different uh, arrays of these colors that you use. In other words, your corners would be, you know, a, a different direction. You, know, you might have a, a yellow, to a, uh, magenta, to a magenta over here. Uh, you know. So anyway, so it's five, it's remember five, three, four, or four, three, five. Those are major and minor chords. And Frank Morty Fletcher, you'll know, see what, what it's all about instantly with him. So just to go back to the, the foundation for all this, the foundation is the, the CMY, right? The CMY and the uh, RGB. You have, you have six primaries. And which, which are the pigments that you chose again for the CMY? Uh, the CMY was the Quinacridone uh, uh, Rose, the uh, Phalo uh, Green Shade, and the, uh, uh, I, I like the Lemon Yellow most of the time, but uh, sometimes, uh, depending on what the subject matter is, you can do the uh, Permanent Yellow Light. Okay. And lemon and Yellow is a little bit more greenish. So Lemon Yellow, Phalo Blue, uh, and uh, magenta. Nice. And I rose. Perfect. Perfect. Well, this has been great, Michael. Thank you for doing this and, and sharing your studio space. And, and this has been uh, really a revelation to see how you're coming up with these color harmonies using this system. Yeah. Well, I, I hope I hope you can see how beautiful the, the mixes are when you're not doing a uh, a brown or black uh, uh, tonal uh, grayscale as uh, as your lightener and dark dark you know, darkening agent. Oh, definitely the vividness of those colors. You use that, you end up using almost uh, all tertiary colors except for your color key. Yeah. Nice, nice. Well, fantastic. Well, thank you again. And uh, um, when this goes out on Facebook, of course, Michael will be able to see it. I'll be able to see it. And we'll do our best to answer questions in, from the comments. Uh, and uh, I'll forward any too uh, as well. But uh, lots of great information here. And also just fantastic hearing about your journey, Michael, and seeing your work. Thank you so much. You bet. Everybody, thank you, Michael Mantler, for being here. Uh, thank you, everybody, for joining us for this special episode of the Creator Studio Live for all talents. Uh, and we will see everybody next time. Take care.